Um, I'm, I'm actually going to, um, you'll hear a lot of what I speak about today, kind of reiterating some of the things that we've already heard about um, throughout the, the, the conversations that have been had. So three main areas of focus for me. One, why AI, why now? Two, what makes the UK particularly attractive? And finally, what has the UK's response been so far? So we have all seen today and throughout that um, an increase in data and computing capacity has unlocked a surge in the capability and speed of AI technologies. Um, for example, speech recognition technologies, the error rates have fallen from one in five words five years ago to less than one in 20 today, which is just one indicator of the speed um, and capability that we're, we're seeing. We're already also seeing um, the transformative impacts of artificial intelligence. So here within the UK, we have seen in the field of healthcare, Moorfields Eye Hospital partnering with DeepMind, demonstrating that AI technologies could match human experts on diagnosis of eye disease. Department of Health has since invested 79 million pounds in technologies that could reduce deaths from cancer by 10% within the next 15 years. With how we power our homes and tackle climate change, the National Grid has also worked with DeepMind to develop AI technologies to, with the potential to shape 10% off energy bills by, trans, by optimizing the use of renewable energy. And also in how we combat extremism. In February two, uh, 2018, the Home, off, the home Secretary announced um, that ASI Data Science, which is now known as Faculty, um, had developed technologies that could flag 95% of ISIS videos online for takedown. Um, and also we have seen incredible promises that have been made um, So in, in the scale of the impact of these technologies. So for example, Accenture um, has projected 25% uplift in labor productivity here in the UK by 2030. So the, these are all things that have not gone unnoticed um, across the world. We know that we have also heard that AI is the engine driving the fourth industrial revolution, bringing with it great opportunities to deliver long-term economic and social change. We have heard, and, and I think the professor mentioned that Putin as well has said, I did not know that it was Putin, but now I will, I do, um, that technologies that, in, um, that countries that invest in these technologies uh, will be defining the economies of the future. Europe has launched a coordinated action plan on AI, which will increase its annual investments in AI by 70%, and has encouraged its member states to create national AI strategies and investment programs. So we're doing a little bit around the planning that we heard about. Um, we know that the US and China together account for 82% of the global investment in AI startups, so a lot of the money being funneled in are from two nations. Um, and the UK has taken a few steps as well. So we introduced a near one billion pound investment in, um, in the AI ecosystem last year as part of our AI sector deal. So what is it that makes the UK particularly attractive? Well, 60% of UK companies with double digit growth intend to use more artificial intelligence to improve their decision making in the next 12 months. Only the US and Germany scored higher in the survey, which focused on 800 leaders across, the, across Europe and America. Managers recognize that there are challenges. 46% are undecided, but the rest, 56%, want more support to help them prepare for the introduction of these technologies. The UK is in fourth place for global distribution of AI startups. We have more than 1,000 AI startups and SMEs in the UK, with, the Lon with London being the second top regional hub following San Francisco. So we saw some of this data presented earlier. UK businesses are applying AI across many sectors, life sciences, financial services, retail, transport, security, just to name a few. And we have a strong academic research uh, with many university spin-outs and strong entrepreneurship ecosystems, such as Entrepreneur First. 70% of new AI startup founders in London, half of whom come, across, come from, across, uh, from overseas, rank London as the best place, or generally better, when it comes to access to clients, 
with a ready appetite to adopt than other major AI hubs. But there's still more work to do here. So what has the UK's response been to, to all of these trends? Well, we have done what the UK does best, so we've created three new institutions. <laughs> so I'll, ta I'll talk about these three, and then I'll end with the Office for AI, which is the most important one. No, I'm just um, so we have created the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, which touches on Paul's point around balancing innovation with regulation. So they are looking at uh, the, the gaps that exist in our understanding and knowledge that have been introduced by the massive advances that we've made in AI and data-driven technologies. They are a arm's length body from government, so currently they are not a policy making nor a regulatory body, but they have the potential to become both. Uh, they have gone out for public consultation and all the information about the Center for Data Ethics can be found online. The two areas of focus for them this year are around bias and online targeting. We have just announced our AI Council, Paul Clark, we are very lucky to have him sitting as one of, our, one of the members of our AI Council. This is a, a group of independent expert uh, bodies representing uh, government, the private sector and the public sector, you know, and the academics, coming together to advise government on our priorities. They are here to tell us where we should focus our attention, they're here to help organizations when they are coming to asking questions as to how do we use these technologies better and crucially, what do we need to do to our institutions to ensure that this diffusion works properly. And they are here as a loudspeaker for the work that we are doing in government so that our messages can get out more broadly. And finally, we've got the Office for AI, which is the, uh, a joint unit between our Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, DCMS, and our Department for Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy, BAYS, um, which I head up. We have been set up to deliver against the commitments that were made in the AI sector deal um, and to realize the UK's AI strategy. So the Office for AI is, at, is working to build the foundations in data, leadership, and skills to underpin the adoption and diffusion of AI and data-driven technologies across the private and the public sector for the betterment of society. And for us, it's really important that it is to better society, not just for the sake of making us more productive or adding to the economy, but to better society, to answer some of the questions that were being faced earlier, asked earlier about the, the, the potential of these technologies to make socioeconomic differences even wider. We are here to make sure that um, we put in the infrastructure that stops that from happening as much as we can. Um, we've been working very hard to deliver on our five priority areas. That includes leadership, so that, that is the announcement of our AI Council that will be meeting, um, it will have its first uh, official meeting this autumn. Um, about access to data, so we have been partnering with the Open Data Institute, um, discussing and piloting three versions of data trusts. Um, again, all of this information is online. You can find that there. Around sector diffusion, so we've been working and partnering with colleagues across government to deliver a review of where AI is being used in government today, crucially where it should be used going forward, and addressing challenges around GovTech about bringing um, emerging technologies into government and how do we facilitate that? What are the principles that allow us to do that better? So we have actually, uh, we have a SICOND um, in California right now working at the World Economic Forum Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, looking at principles to improve uh, bringing emerging technologies into government, procuring these technologies through the lens of AI. We have uh, a number of, uh, we collaborate across inter um, international boundaries with a lot of countries, so that is another piece of work that we do at the Office for AI. And finally, around skills. Um, I wanted to dwell a little bit on skills and tell you about some of the things that we've been doing. So we know that the competition for AI know-how is intense. Demand is already far outstripping supply and high salaries or enormously high salaries are available for people with AI skills. We also have a massive diversity issue when it comes to AI. We know that 
it is absolutely unacceptable that only one in 10 women um, are machine learning researchers. Um, and there are particular issues for AI in the absence of diversity of thought, but not just thought, but also in the data that we see. And the, these algorithms themselves are not biased, but what they do is hold up a mirror to the bias that we have as a society. It does not have to be this way. Up to the 1980s, 40% of computer scientists were women. And then something happened. So we need to figure that out and work on it. We've been working to make sure that everyone is able to benefit from the opportunities that are presented by artificial intelligence and to ensure the businesses have access to the AI talents that they need to operate. Over the last year, we have been concentrating mostly on the top end of skills. And going forward, we, look, we are going to look at the rest, including <laughs> the reskilling, upskilling, and lifelong learning that was spoken about on the panel. For those at the top end, 40%. We have, we have um, put in 100 million pounds to uh, introduce 16 new centers for, doctoral, for centers for doctoral training across the country, which will introduce 1,000 new PhDs into the ecosystem by the year 2025. We have committed 50 million pounds to attract and retain top AI talent to the UK. For those in mid-career, we have developed in partnership between industry and academia, an industrial master's program that is funded by industry to introduce master's students, 200 new master's students, the first cohort of which will go live this September. We are now considering the broader requirements of AI skills to deliver on the opportunity to improve productivity and grow the UK economy identified in our industrial strategy and the review that was done by Dame Wendy Holland and Jerome Pacenti through introducing conversion courses, as well as exploring the skills that the population need in order to work successfully with AI. Last week, we announced 13 million pounds into data and AI degree conversion courses and diversity scholarships. So this is directly trying to focus on the diversity issue. 2,500 places will be made available for AI and data conversion courses starting next year to equip tech-driven businesses and people across the country with the skills that they need. This includes 1,000 government-funded scholarships to open up opportunities for people from all backgrounds. The UK is a home to a thriving and vibrant AI ecosystem, with many AI professionals who have come from an IT background contributing greatly to the flourishing of this sector. But we need to go further. And if you'd like to support our work, for example, become an industry sponsor for the AI Masters, or to contribute to our work in productivity or, and diversity, please do get in touch. I, I like to always end with an ask for the, for the audience. So that is my ask for you today. And I, I do look forward, um, at, just like Paul, I'm very optimistic about what these technologies can do for us. And I look forward to, to seeing the transformation that, that they can make and the potential that they have. Thank you.